right, thanks for joining us for another edition of the Muscle Media 2000 audio tape interview series. And this month's guest is Mike Menser once again. And uh, Mike, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I hear you well. Okay. Uh, I have to tell you, you were not the planned guest uh, for this month's uh, interview, uh -huh. but I got so much mail and I got so many uh, responses uh, from people who listened to our first conversation a couple months ago, uh -huh. and they just, they had so many questions and they were so excited about this, uh, this new training concept that, you know, it's kind of a popular demand type of issue so here we are again right. why, why do you think people got so excited from that first interview because I've never seen anything like it well I have to, to say here too I was more than pleasantly surprised by the response to that tape while I had delivered the information in such a way to have a certain impact the impact was much greater than I ever dreamed it would be in terms of both volume and intensity of response uh, and I, I thought about it quite a bit analyze it from different angles and found it quite fascinating actually. It has been averred by too many people too many times, Bill, that all bodybuilders are dumb. Mm -hmm. A dumb person is one who doesn't know the truth but slaps them in the face. The response to my tape proved that not all bodybuilders are dumb. In fact, they are far from it. Right. As clear as I was on that tape, it takes a at least a fairly well-developed mind to follow the long trains of reasoning that I used. Many who responded couldn't clearly verbalize what it was they liked, but I, I realized in analyzing later on that what they were what they were responding to were in fact their own values. Mm -hmm. Aristotle defined a friend as that other person, that one in whom we see ourselves. Those who responded positively to that take value, knowledge, science, reason, the mind, and human progress. Right. Well, that makes that makes sense. The, you had some extraordinary cases of, uh, you know, like, like uh, excitement. I mean... Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, I just talked to a guy this morning who claimed that since he first received that tape several months ago, he's listened to it at least 15 to 20 times, and that is not a uh, an unusual statement. I've had, I didn't keep an accurate count here, of course, but I've had so many people call me and tell me that they've listened to the tape at least a dozen times that I, I'm actually quite shocked. I, I've been joking about it now. I say, yeah, listening to Mike Mentor is better than listening to Michael Jackson. Right. Some people had uh, experienced fairly intense emotions and even grew almost lyrically mystical about it, uh, claiming they became addicted to listening, it, actually addicted to, to it, doing so at home, in, their, uh, in the gym with their training partners, and in their cars on the way to work. Right. What they liked, actually, was the meticulous use of logic and the broad philosophical scientific context in which they heard bodybuilding, their great passion, discussed, and the crystal clear understanding, of course, which this helped them to achieve. Right. Now, I, I, I think that there's something going on, and then, like I said, that's why, you know, we're going to go back and we're going to ask, so go over some of the points that we talked about in the first tape in this interview, and we're going to, you know, take it a step further, uh -huh. but it, it is fascinating, and I will admit that I didn't expect people to become, you know, that outrageously enthusiastic well, about another... It has a sensation of sorts that uh, I was just dreaming the other day that it would be great if 200,000 bodybuilders could hear that tape. It would cause a dramatic revolution in the sport. Yeah, I agree with that, <clears throat> Mike. Many more people need to you know, get this information, but that's what we're trying to do with the tapes. And I'll tell uh, our listeners, who are also Muscle Media 2000 subscribers, that there's an article uh, about you that's pretty interesting in the next issue of Muscle Media 2000, and we hope to get your input on a regular basis so that we can share this message with more people about how to really train uh, for size and strength gains. Can you tell me a little bit about where you think some of the ill-conceived ideas uh, that are so you know, prevalent in, in, in weight training today came from? Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is an issue I've given some considerable thought to recently. Quite a few of the people who call me, Bill, are still reluctant to fully let go of what they used to believe about bodybuilding. 
are having a little bit of a hard time fully accepting what they heard on the first tape, despite its clarity and, and the logic. I tell those people that in order to be able to successfully discard from their subconscious all those ideas that are hampering them and clashing with these new ideas they heard on the tape, it might, it might be beneficial if I pointed out to them where those ideas came from, the old ideas. Right. In fact, the basic premises which shaped the thought and determined the actions of the vast majority of bodybuilders today, Bill, originated in the early part of this century with the man who was responsible for starting the weightlifting bodybuilding movement in this country, Bob Huffman. Uh, in the 1920s, Bob Huffman decided that he would manufacture and sell barbells. Of course, along with the barbells, he had to provide a training manual. Having but a near to middling education, with little or nothing in the areas of science, philosophy, or logic, Bob Huffman, like everybody else for whom that is true, was victim to the power of tradition. Something I learned reading Ayn Rand in philosophy recently is that the role of chance, accident, and tradition in a person's life stands in inverse ratio to the power of that individual's philosophical equipment. For those of you who really love the philosophy, and there were a lot of those, by the way. Mm -hmm. Bob Hoffman was an old-fashioned, traditional kind of a guy. In our culture, the number three has a certain traditional magic. For instance, there's three square meals a day. There's three sides to a triangle. There's the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Things like that. Traditional ideas. In formulating a training methodology, Bob Hoffman said everybody trained three times a week. Why not? It uh, seems to be a, a number that works so well in so many other areas. The point here is that tradition, I'm sorry, science has nothing to do with the arbitrary, including tradition. Many of our traditional beliefs are actually arbitrary or based on convenience. I tell those people who have a hard time working with some of these new ideas, look where these ideas came from. Where did Bob Hoffman get the idea of three? Because we eat three square meals a day, and there's a father, son, a holy ghost, there's three, there's pyramid power. Some, some people actually believe there's a special magic with a pyramid or a triangle. Mm -hmm. That's mystical. It has nothing to do with science. Why didn't Bob Huffman suggest everyone train three times a month, in fact? Another good point. Because 99% of the people in this country and all over the world plan their lives short range in terms of a week. Many of the people that I've talked to on the phone who have heard this and came to understand it found it easier to discard some of that old stuff. They took my advice, the advice I gave on the first date. They discarded what they thought they knew. They're taking a fresh, new, unobstructed look at this thing. They're willing to experiment, uh, work with these new ideas, and are, in fact, training only two to three times each month for each body part. And in almost every single case, they're reporting at least satisfactory progress, and in some cases, dramatic, and in other cases, even phenomenal progress. So that would be every body part, like once every 10 days? Yeah, or even less frequently. Wow. You see, the, the point that I made on the first tape is perhaps one I, I should emphasize again here. More is not really better. That really should be thoroughly just pretend you never even heard that idea. Take a fresh, new, unobstructed look at this thing. Why shouldn't you train necessarily two or three times? I'm not saying that is definitely the best way to do it, but if you understand where those other beliefs came from, and you understand the necessity of taking a fresh, new, unobstructed look at this thing, why not give serious consideration to the idea of training each body part only two or three times a month? Hmm. Why not? No, no logical reason. There's no reason. I'm emphasizing all of this only because of the, the reluctance, again, of some people to, to embrace these new ideas or to, to give them any serious consideration at all. Right. <laughs> well, I think that something that, I mean, that is the big thing. A lot of people are, are saying, well, Mike is, is probably right in a way, but I'm probably right in a way. Also. Right in a way? Hold on a second. Uh -huh. I don't grant anybody the premise that there's somebody else out there who has given this thing more serious consideration than I have. Mm -hmm. If he's out there, Billy's hiding. 
I'm not saying I've got the ultimate or final answer, but I have no doubt I'm going in the right direction. If you can come up with one single individual who, who can point out a contradiction in my logic, I'll give you $1,000 because I'd like to learn, too. I'm not saying that I'm omniscient or it's fallible. Again, I don't necessarily have all the answers, but I'm sure about, I'm certain about what I'm certain about. Right. So and not only is true in theory, this stuff works in practice. Okay. A lot of people are still continuing to say it only works for Mike Mincer and Casey Viator and perhaps now Dorian Yates. That is not true, but if it did, did work even just for one person, don't you think, dear listener, it would be at least worth trying? Mm -hmm. if, if for no other reason, then you could save all that time in the gym. Right. To go a little bit further, by the way, with this idea of traditional beliefs and where most bodybuilders, where most bodybuilders get their, their ideas, the ideas that shape their thinking and guide their actions in the gym. Not too long after Bob Hoffman was on the scene, perhaps 15 to 20 years, a guy named Joe Weider came along. Joe Weider didn't like the fact that this old-fashioned fuddy-duddy, Bob Huffman over there in York, Pennsylvania, had such a stranglehold on the market. Joe Weider wanted to wrest some of the market away from him. He said, I'm progressive. I'm a progressive individual. Don't train three times a week. More is better. Train six days a week. But he wasn't that progressive because he still suggested everybody take Sunday off for Sabbath. Crazy. Very scientific. <laughs> so this is just fueling. I mean, there's just. I mean, now people are doing, uh, you know, everyday training and sometimes two times a day training. I mean, is it despite what you've been trying to get across, people are just continuing to train more and more from where I stand? Well, there, there is that particular element. There are those bodybuilders who apparently never came to identify the, the role or nature or value of logic, reason, science in their lives, and I mean that literally. There are those individuals for whom you can paint a picture so clear a blind man or idiot could understand it, but it has no impact in their consciousness. Mm -hmm. Their actions are guided primarily by what they see others doing, and we talked about this on the first tape. Right. Most people are, in fact, intellectually dependent, and a lot of bodybuilders are. I made this, this argument very clearly in all of my articles, all of my books and seminars all over the world, and apparently most people just, a lot of people, just don't understand the power, the crucial importance of a logical argument. Again, they do what they do based on what they see other people doing. Well, how can Mike Mincer be right? Why should he be so certain when, in fact, everybody else seems to be doing it quite differently? Just the other day in Gold's Gym, a man said that to me. Why are you so darn certain? And I said, well, aren't you certain that two and two is four? Why are you pissed off that I'm certain about this? Why can't I be? If you're certain that two and two is four, I can be certain about this, and I am certain. If you would take the time and listen to the logic of my argument and find one contradiction, I'll throw the whole damn thing out. Mm -hmm. This stuff is literally true. If, if NASA, the Space Administration, can send a man to the moon and bring him back successfully each time, then why can't we succeed with each one of our missions to the gym? Why can't we build muscles here on Earth? Right. There is a science of exercise, people. There really is. I, I said that on the last tape, and I've been telling a lot of people since, and I, I see now quite clearly, Bill, that a lot of this has to do with a failure of people to integrate their knowledge. We all know that NASA exists. We all know that there's a science of medicine and a, a science of astronomy, a science of physics and mathematics. In mathematics, two and two is four. I don't care how big the arm of the guy is who asserts it's five, it's still four. Mm -hmm. There is a scientific approach to exercise too, people. There really is. I know you've been reading those muscle magazines and becoming mesmerized by the pictures of all those great bodybuilders. And as a result, you're forgetting to use the knowledge you gained in grammar school, high school, college. Mm -hmm. There is a science of medicine. The science of exercise, like I said on the first tape, like the science of medicine, is based on principles of human physiology. They apply to everybody. What about the group of people, and this is what I've discovered, is that they're saying, well, I've been doing 15 sets, and Mike says to do one. 
So I think that I would be ahead if I cut down to five or six. I mean, is that is that any benefit to these people? Well, they're 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 better off if for no other reason than they're not so severely overtrained and possibly damaging their body, and they're saving some time. But they're missing one crucial point here. We're not just looking to do less or to do what feels just about right. What we're looking for here, Bill and listener, is the precise amount of exercise required. As I said on the first tape, too, mm -hmm. science is an exact, an exacting discipline. A proper science of bodybuilding, therefore, should tell the individual exactly how many sets to do. The muscle magazines continue to advocate that everybody do 12 to 20. That's not very exact. Is it 12 or is it 20? It's not exact at all, and therefore it's not scientific. Science, as I said a moment ago, is an exact and exacting discipline. Imagine we're down there with my favorite people, Nassau, at Houston headquarters control Nassau before, before a manned moon launch. And the director yells down to the end of the control module, Hey, Fred, why don't you try throwing a blue switch this time instead of a red one? Let's see what happens. You think you'd ever get to the moon? <laughs> see my point when I say science is an exact discipline? Perhaps a better analogy here is this. Bill, if you were going to go into surgery tomorrow, you would very much want your anesthesiologist to give you the precise amount of anesthesia necessary. Any more than that, you, you would grow toxic and possibly die. The point is this. The human being is a specific entity with specific characteristics and specific requirements. The key concept there is specific. I call my approach to bodybuilding, Bill, a rational approach. The basis of a rational approach to bodybuilding, or any other arena of human endeavor actually, is the recognition that only the specific appropriate knowledge can lead one to engage in the purposeful action required to successfully achieve a goal. I came to understand recently, during a period of more serious thought on this, that in fact the concept of specificity is the most important concept in science. The concept of specificity shapes and underlies the phenomena of rationality itself. Why is life today, Bill, and the 1990s so much better in so many ways than it was 50, 100, or 500 years ago? Because of science. Mm -hmm. Because of science. The purpose of science is to identify the facts of reality from those facts derive a theory whose principles serve as a guideline for successful action. This is what I'm trying to get across to people something which I consider crucially important and that will help elevate the entire sport or industry of bodybuilding in the public's eye and in the eyes of the scientific medical community. The way it's being practiced now, the way it's being written about now, the way it's being thought about now, is a god darn stupid bill. I, I can't believe that these people are so impervious to reason. Mm -hmm. Most people are living not in a dark age, but in a black hole. <laughs> Remember the dark ages of 500 years ago? Mm -hmm. The dark ages was a period when mankind's progress broke down. They, people turned away from the teachings of Aristotle. That is, they rejected logic, reason, knowledge, progress, and even freedom. When you reject reason, science, and progress, you also lose your freedom as an end result. After the Dark Ages came a renaissance. The renaissance was, the term renaissance literally means rebirth, the rebirth of reason. The renaissance was that period during which men returned to the teachings of Aristotle, the man who defined the laws of logic, identified the principles of thought. He was the man who discovered the scientific method. Up until recently, bodybuilding was caught up in a dark ages of its own. It wasn't until 19, about 1969, 1970, with, with the emergence of Arthur Jones on the scene, that we exited the dark age and emerged into a renaissance of our own. <clears throat> Arthur Jones was, was and is a man of reason. He understood the requirements of logic, the requirements of developing a theory. He did develop a theory which was 
validated by myself and many people. We couldn't find any contradictions in the logic. We also used it. We proved empirically that it does work. But as happened after Aristotle, the first Aristotle, his, his works were lost. And people did go into a dark age. Now, it's possible that the entire world of bodybuilding will fail to see the enormous importance of what Arthur Jones especially has contributed and what, I've, what I'm attempting to perpetuate and expand upon by providing a broader philosophic scientific context within which to, to view bodybuilding. Makes sense? And yeah, it does. I mean, you, you talk about... I, I don't want to sound too professorial here, but this is obviously a subject that people value quite passionately. Mm -hmm. If they want to be assured of succeeding, then they have to acquire the specific appropriate knowledge necessary. Right. Now, you talk about the... Uh, you know, I, I know that you, you've studied all the way, uh, you know, bodybuilding you know, way back, and I think you said one time it, you know, really originated in ancient Greece. I mean, what is your... Uh... Well, that, that's something else a lot of bodybuilders don't know, and it's a very interesting point. The activity, the phenomena of bodybuilding itself, arose 2,300 years ago in the age of classical Greek. The concept of philosophy itself arose at the same time with Plato. Plato was the man who identified the concept of philosophy itself and pointed out that there are crucial issues which pertain to philosophy, issues like what is reality, what is knowledge, how does man gain it, and validate it. In the years since the classical Greeks, philosophy has undergone a, a dramatic deterioration. Uh, there was a little bright spark there during the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, but now here in the 1990s, the late 20th century, we're back into a, not just a dark age, but a black hole. People want and are failing to understand the values of knowledge, reason, logic, science, human progress, and freedom. It's only within a philosophical context that people can gain the knowledge required to achieve their goals. Remember, the basis of a rational approach to bodybuilding is the recognition that only the specific appropriate knowledge can lead one to engage in the purposeful action required to successfully achieve a goal. It would help a whole lot if an individual took some time to study what knowledge itself is. How can you know that the ideas guiding you are valid if you don't know how to distinguish truth from falsehood? Again, this is, I'm pointing all this out because I see this as my role in bodybuilding. I see myself as the voice of reason, bringing a, a wide-scale, philosophic, scientific context to all this. And if there are those of you who think I'm sounding too professorial or this is too intellectual, well, then you, uh, you have my best wishes because you're lost. This is what human life is about, people. Knowledge. Mm -hmm. And what would you recommend for people who... I mean, I, I've gotten some letters from people who want to, you know, get more into, you know, the uh, the things that, that you are studying. I mean, the, the philosophy and stuff. You you study Rand? Right. And I, Ayn Rand is the, not the only, but the major philosopher of the 20th century who has brought back to our awareness the crucial importance of Aristotle, the man who, I, again, identified the laws of logic, defined the principles of thought, discovered scientific method. He pointed out that man needs a method of cognition, a method of thinking. Logic is that method. Logic is a method for using your mind. If you don't learn how to use it, then you're going to be lost. You will be not subject, but victim to all manner of false ideas. Bill, you and I are old enough to know that the entire world, including the world of bodybuilding, is literally awash in a sea of false ideas. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, what about people who want to get more information on Rand? I mean, is that, uh, books? Yeah, if, if, an, if a given individual listening is interested in studying philosophy, 
be very, very careful. Ideas are crucially important. I, Ayn Rand pointed out that philosophy is the wholesaler of man's affair. Everything we're doing even now, Bill, is philosophy. Mm -hmm. a, lot of it, a, lot of it, a lot of it is explicit. It's clearly verbalized. Involved in what we're doing are a lot of implicit ideas. One of the most interesting ones, which is uh, comes from romantic philosophy, we do love knowledge. Those listening to the tape do love knowledge. That implies that they value their life. If you value knowledge, then you value your means of survival, which is your mind. If you value your means of survival, then you value your life. This is how interesting philosophy, how interesting philosophy can get. If you're interested, listener, in studying philosophy at all, be careful. Ideas are crucially important. The wrong idea can lead you down the wrong path, as, ha as happened in... Uh, of course, pre-World War II Germany. There was a reason why the Nazis took over. It was pointed out in a book recently by Dr. Leonard Peikoff, Ayn Rand's intellectual error, that before every dictator's takeover, that dictator undertakes a campaign to literally destroy the people's confidence in reason, in knowledge. Hmm. Hitler literally hired a bunch of writers a bunch of quacks to disseminate information whose ultimate purpose was to undermine people's confidence in their own ability to think and perceive reality. A dictator cannot take over in a country, Bill, where people are independent, i.e. know how to think for themselves. What is independence? In order to become an independent individual, you have to learn how to think so you can deal with reality successfully. Mm -hmm. People who are dependent are people who don't know how to think. That's, that's true. So, so be careful, people. That was my point. I would suggest rather than just jumping into philosophy blindly by caprice, you'd be very careful and start out with Ayn Rand. Just as there is and can be, Bill, only one valid theory of bodybuilding or one valid theory of medicine, astronomy, physics, it's also true there can only be one valid theory of life. Man's life, man himself has a specific nature. You can, you can only formulate a valid working theory of life if you understand man's nature, and that was Ayn Rand's passion. Her passion was man's consciousness. She understood that Man is, in fact, the divine spark in the great chain of being. Man is the highest of all living species. We are the intelligent, creative force in the world. Man said, let there be light, and now all we got to do is switch on a light. Uh -huh. hmm. So, libraries? Yeah, her books can be found in libraries, but she's becoming quite popular, and her books can be found in most bookstores. She was, in addition to being a philosopher, Bill, a novelist. And her philosophy is contained in her novels. Hmm. The two most famous being The Fountainhead, which was made into a movie at one time, and also Atlas Shrugged. Atlas Shrugged can appear a bit formidable to a beginner in this area. It's about 1,200 pages. So if you're interested, listener, in getting involved in philosophy and reading Ayn Rand, I suggest you start with one of her novels, The Fountainhead. In addition, what you might consider doing actually concurrently to reading that is reading one of her book, uh, books of essays on philosophy. Probably the best place to start would be philosophy, so needs it. A good question. <laughs> Many people re regard philosophy rather gingerly as nothing more than a bauble of the intellect, as Leonard Peikoff pointed out. In fact, is the most crucial fact or factor or power in human life. Think about it seriously. What is it that's guiding us today? What has allowed Bill Phillips to become more successful than so many other people? He's got a philosophy. He's identified the value of productive work, using his mind, searching for truth, learning how to distinguish truth from falsehood. That's his philosophy, whether he's stated it, whether he has stated it explicitly or just leaves it to being implicit. But I'm sure he has done that at different times, and all of you have listening to this tape. At some point in their lives, most people have identified the values of logic, reason, knowledge, progress, freedom. These are all ideas. 
the problem is very often people identify those things and then they they're so caught up in the dramatic rush of events in their daily life they fail to identify one crucial idea that would really help them in this area and that is the the importance of defining their philosophy they go yeah okay i like that idea i understand knowledge is very important but then they forget it and they fail to take the time to study knowledge and find out what it's really all about hmm. This is, I mean, this is fascinating stuff. Philosophy is about ideas. What we're doing today, everything that we do on this tape, everything you did in your last tape with Brad Jeffries was an exchange of ideas. Ideas are the wholesaler of man's affairs. The efficacy of an individual's actions depend on whether or not his ideas are true or false, right or wrong, consistent or inconsistent, rational or irrational. How can you discover whether or not the ideas guiding you in your life are true or false, right or wrong. By studying philosophy, this is the purpose of philosophy, to define knowledge, provide man with a means of cognition or thinking, provide him with a means of distinguishing truth from falsehood, provide him with a means or a method of establishing the criteria of what he may rightfully accept as knowledge. This is the most crucial fact in human life. Do you think they would have gotten to the moon successfully if they hadn't taken ideas seriously? Science is not just something for people in white lab coats or coats running around the Nassau building or in medical labs. Science is a way of thinking. It's a way of understanding and feeling the world. You don't have to be a genius or a professional intellectual to, to do it. Philosophy is actually fun. The problem is that in most of our public schools, we are taught to associate learning with drudgery, boredom. Right. That's the problem. You have to you have to reprogram your computer, people. You have to identify explicitly the value of knowledge in your life and make it fun. What could be more ingenious? What could be more exciting than waking up every day enthusiastic to go out there and look for more knowledge? Like the Buddha did. Remember the Buddha? Yeah. Bill Phillips, I'll, I'll bet you, I'll bet, I know you as little as I do, I'll bet there was a time when you read about the Buddha and you got excited. Yeah, no, I mean, I think... You I've... even identified with him. Right? Yeah, that's true. But you probably gave up on philosophy because, in fact, the Buddha's philosophy is a lot of hogwash, too. There, there are certain romantic elements to it. There is and can be only one valid theory of philosophy, and Ayn Rand had the greatest mind in the history of the human race. She thoroughly identified the value, nature, principles, role of philosophy in human life. And she has a lot of people in this world actually quite excited. Imagine that in here in the 20th century, the greatest mind in the history of the human race came along and actually for the first time defined what knowledge itself is. She realized at one point in her life that she wanted to integrate as much knowledge into her mind as she possibly could. She realized, she was smart enough to realize that as a precondition, she had to know what knowledge itself was. That's really getting serious about thinking. Yes, that's true. Take the time and identify what the concept of knowledge itself is. How can you, how can you know that you have valid knowledge in bodybuilding if you don't know what knowledge is? I hope this is not scaring anybody. This is supposed to be exciting. <laughs> it's fascinating, and I'll, I'll say it again. It is absolutely gripping because, you know, I mean, it, uh, it's just something you don't you don't hear from too many people. Not not too many people have a, a real passion for knowledge. And I mean, well, as, as I said on the first tape too, we live in a militantly anti-rational culture where people are actively discouraged from thinking. That's true. Why? Because. Many of our schools for the last 30 or 40 years have been using the teaching, teaching method of John Dewey, the progressive education method. John Dewey was militantly anti-cognitive, anti-conceptual. He believed that teaching children to think was literally an unnatural burden. He believed that children should be brought to school to give free expression to their natural impulses, which is a bunch of garbage. Why should you let children who are already wild be left unrestrained and give vent to their 
so-called natural impulses. Beyond that, he said the purpose of education was to teach children to conform to society. And as Ayn Rand pointed out, what does that mean? To cruelty, injustice, murder, mockery, snobs, pretentiousness. That's, that's what we see about us today in society. And even back then when John Dewey was advocating his theory, I came to find out recently, quite interestingly, that the man who funded the progressive education movement in this country, the man who gave a tremendous impetus, impetus to John Dewey's educational movement was David Rockefeller, whose purpose is to start a one world government. Now remember, John Dewey's philosophy is militantly anti-cognitive, anti-conceptual. He literally didn't want to teach children to think. He wanted to stultify their minds, hamper, cripple them as much as he possibly fucking could so that possibly David Rockefeller could take over the world. Remember, Hitler, Hitler wasn't the first one to use this, but Hitler raised it to an art form. Hitler literally hired writers to, to print and distribute pamphlets and books undermining the populace's confidence in reason, making them dependents by children, be led by a strong paternalistic government. That's what a dictatorship is, people. This stuff is starting to scare me a little bit because I see it's so darn clear. <laughs> I suspect Arthur Jones did too. He, he told me a while back that when he was in his 30s and 40s, he started enlightening himself and started to see what was going on in this world politically. We are literally, this whole world is going in the direction of status tyranny. How is it to be achieved? Through philosophy. By undermining people's confidence in the power of their own minds. Don't think for yourself. Be led by a strong paternalistic government. Right. So that, of course, philosophy, as important as it is in helping an individual decide on what kind of a bodybuilding routine to perform, it has social implications. Yeah, that, that's for sure. Most people, how are you going to know what's going on in the world if you don't know what's going on in the bodybuilding world? And most bodybuilders don't know what they have thing about bodybuilding. This scares me a little bit. Most bodybuilders passion, passionately value this thing. Bill, you know that. They're, they're so darn fanatic, it's almost funny. Right. In one sense, it's, it's actually kind of endearing because they're so romantic about it. They so much value their lives. They want to achieve goals. Right. But they don't know how to think about it. If they haven't learned how to think about bodybuilding itself, you think they've taken the time to look out into the world around them and learn to identify what's going on out there either. Yeah, yeah. This is what happened to, to the people in pre-World War II Germany. That's how they got led into fascism and Nazism. They couldn't identify what was going on before it was too late. You see, you see this. Oh, yeah. No, I, I see what you're talking about. When people don't know how to think, when they don't take the time to sit down look out into the world and identify and evaluate what's going on, which is something you can't do, by the way, if you don't have a sufficiently developed conceptual faculty. You have to have the concepts, the ideas, the words necessary to identify and evaluate the facts. And what happens? Mm -hmm. You're opening up the path to any dictator who wants to come in and tell you what to do. And that's what's happening. We are progressively losing our freedoms, without a doubt. Now they're, they're going after the supplement industry. Right. As I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of, of nutritional supplements, but I would fight to defend their right to, to, sell, to sell that stuff. Right. I think people should be informed about which ones to take and not to take if they need them at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the government has no right to legislate our lives. Who, who is the government anyway? Their track record ain't so great. They ain't the greatest makers in the world. Right. If you find this boring, dear listener, then you have my best wishes again because we're talking about life here as well. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you 100%. But, uh... And all of, all of this, even if you forget about it 10 minutes from now, it'll come up in your mind again. Learning to look out and understand life in general makes achieving your bodybuilding goals a lot more exciting, too. If all you do is achieve bodybuilding goals or come to understand bodybuilding, 
then you're in kind of a vacuum. There's a big world out there and you can't ignore it. You will continually feel the pressure of that world on you if you don't take the time to sit down, learn how to think about it, identify it and evaluate it. There will always be that pressure. You will know that you're failing somewhere in your life. You'll feel, you'll feel an odd sense of guilt. Mm -hmm. This stuff is fun. Learn to look out in the world. By learning how to identify what you see, it becomes much less frightening. Remember when you were a kid, Bill, you screamed when, it lightning, when there was lightning? Oh, yeah. And thunder? Now, what caused you not to be afraid of it? You gained the knowledge that it was a natural phenomenon. It wasn't something mysterious or magical or mystical that you should be frightened of. As soon as your parents or your teachers told you what it was, as soon as you gained a scientific understanding of that aspect of the universe, it failed to frighten you. Right. This is why knowledge is so important. Hmm. But you, you mentioned Arthur Jones. Um, was he a, in, into philosophy or, or just uh, was he just a, a thinker by, by nature? No. Arthur Jones told my brother a long time ago, and I'll, I'll quote him here exactly. He said when he was in his 30s, he was tremendously emotionally fucked up. Mm -hmm. Something happened in his life in his late 30s, early 40s. I have every reason to believe that he literally discovered Ayn Rand and or Aristotle. I'm sure, I have no doubt. It had to be that. Mm -hmm. He understood that there was something going on inside of him that he couldn't understand, he didn't like. He said he was emotional. I don't like to use the term fucked up too often, <laughs> but he did say that. He said, I was emotionally fucked up. He sought to understand the reasons for it. He wanted to learn how to think about what was going on inside of him. And this is the, the interstate of most people today. A lot of you who are listening are becoming quite intensely interested now because you're, you're identifying with some of this stuff. I've had my problems too. The, on, the only way you can come to understand your problems, your emotions, your thinking, is to learn how to think. This requires a certain type of discipline which only philosophy can teach you. <laughs> and it's not even a required course in high school or college. <laughs> No, it's, um, again, it's regarded rather gingerly by most people in the teaching profession. When you bring the subject of, up to most people, they, they giggle or titter and think that perhaps you have an emotional problem. <laughs> right. Mike, no, and, and, uh, Mike, you left off with, you know, explaining the importance of, of thinking and being independent and developing yourself in that way, intellectually, and how that can reflect on, you know, your success at bodybuilding and, and all things in life, I think. One of the questions that I, I like to, to bat around uh, when I uh, get a chance is, why do you think it is, and, and I don't know if you have any thought on this or, or whatever, but why do, you, why do you think it is that people want to build their bodies to begin with? I mean, to be, I mean, especially, and I can say those guys, but you were one of those guys, Mike. I mean, you were freaking huge. Yeah. And strong. Well, why, why shouldn't they want to build their bodies? When uh, Sir Edmund Hillary was asked why he climbed Mount Everest, he said because it was there. Yeah. Well, what's, the, what's most immediate to people? Their bodies. There's nothing wrong in taking care of your body or even wanting to build it as long as it doesn't become a preoccupation and take your focus away from the development of the mind. It was the ancient Greeks. It was in the age of classical Greece, 23 centuries ago, that the dictum, a healthy mind and a healthy bodybuilding, arose. Hmm. And so... There's nothing wrong with building the body as long as you don't miss that most crucial factor or element, the mind.